Hello everyone, today we're going to discuss a special class of functions called periodic functions. As it turns out, many natural rhythms such as blood pressure flow, tidal waves, and light waves exhibit predictable repeating patterns. And these kinds of phenomena are described in mathematics uh, using a special group of functions called periodic functions. Theoretically speaking, a periodic function f <clears throat> is a function that satisfies this condition so that, so that f of x is equal to f of x plus np for all integers n and re some real number p greater than zero. Now, there may be more than one positive value of p for which this holds. For example, if we look at the unit circle and look at a value, say, for example, pi over 6, we know that the really powerful thing about the unit circle is that when you look at a particular angle in either radian or degree measure, then the x value of the point where the terminal side of that angle intersects the unit circle is the cosine of that angle and the y value is the sine of that angle. As it turns out, if I start at pi over 6 and go a full circle around, I get 2 and 1 6 pi if I go in the positive direction, which is counterclockwise. Or if I go all the way this way to pi over 6 minus 2 pi, I'll also that angle will also have the same cosine and the same sine. So as you can see, both sine and cosine exhibit that periodic nature. Now, obviously, if I start on pi over 6 and go 4 pi, in other words, 2 times around the circle, I'll also have the same cosine and sine values. So you could just as easily say, hey, it's periodic with a period of 4 pi. But that's why we have the requirement that we take the smallest such value uh, to be called the period. So that's why we say that sine and cosine are periodic functions with a period of 2 pi. So As you know, we've already studied two periodic functions, as we just mentioned, both sine and cosine exhibit this uh, quality with the constant p, which is greater than zero being two pi. So both of these statements have been described previously. Now we're actually gonna soon learn about trigonometric identities where we'll be able to prove these statements as well. Now, as we discussed just now on the unit circle, you know that, for example, sine of zero is the same as sine of zero plus two pi, is the same as sine of, sine of zero plus four pi, or you can go the other way. You can say it's the same as sine of zero plus negative two pi, or sine of zero plus negative four pi, etc. And the exact same holds for cosine as well. You can verify this for yourself to make sure you understand it before we go on. So remember that this makes both the sine and cosine functions periodic with a period of 2 pi. Now, if we take these values for sine and cosine that we obtained from the unit circle, what we can do is we can create a Cartesian coordinate plane as we have here, and we can start making a table of values in this way. In this particular example, we are exhibiting the sine function. So notice that, for example, I've shown a couple of what's called um, cycles of this function. Note if we start at negative 2 pi, we know that that's right here, so the sine of negative 2 pi is going to be the y value, so it's 0, that's where that 0 comes from. 
and then we can go to negative 3 pi over 2 so we start here that's negative pi over 2 negative 2 pi over 2 negative 3 pi over 2 ends up here we know the sign is 1 so that's where this 1 in the table comes from and then we move on to negative pi so if we start here negative pi will be here we know the sign is 0 so we continue like this and complete this table and we notice this repeating pattern of the sine function and if we plot these on the Cartesian coordinate plane so that in the horizontal direction we're representing the angle values well in this particular case we've done it in radians and uh, in the vertical direction we represent the sine of the corresponding angle value then we get this beautiful repeating pattern and of course we only show part of it here it doesn't actually stop there so if you had uh, an infinite amount of time and care to do this forever then you would notice that the pattern just keeps repeating and continues on and on in both the positive as well as the negative direction so this is precisely why when we want to graph these functions such as sine and cosine and related functions we're only interested in one full cycle for example for the sine function the standard full cycle we show is the one that runs from 0 radians to 2 pi radians notice from 0 to 2 pi sine will achieve all the values it could possibly achieve and as you know the maximum value it achieves is 1 and the minimum value it achieves is negative 1 so once we have that we know the rest is just going to be repeating the same process over and over again of course here we're showing only a few key points so of course between 0 and pi over 2 sine will take on all values between 0 and 1 in a very continuous manner and the same happens from pi over 2 to pi so all these values in between on and on so because of the fact that we know the continuous and smooth nature of this function and those are topics you'll study in much more detail in uh, calculus continuity and smoothness it basically means there are no breaks and there are no jagged edges or anything like that it runs very smoothly and very continuously and since we know that we know that if we just plot a few key points we'll be able to get a pretty good graph of the situation and the function now uh, so as you can see there are no x values there are no real numbers that don't have associated with them some sign value so we say that the domain of the sine function is the entire uh, real number line which we show in this manner we say the domain is all x such that x belongs to r that just means the domain is the set of all real numbers we can also write it as an interval from negative infinity to infinity and the range as you can see the set of all the y values or the outputs is just going to run from negative 1 to 1 including negative 1 and 1 that's why we have the less than or equal to in this um, three-part inequality and that's why we have brackets here instead of parentheses and if you do a very similar analysis for the cosine function you will realize that the cosine function behaves in an extremely similar similar manner and the only difference between the sine and cosine function is going to be the placement and where the their standard cycle begins so we'll look at that on the same graph in a minute but if you look at the values for uh, the table here you can see that for 
negative pi over 2 going around the circle clockwise we end up here we see the cosine we know that that's the x value so that's going to be 1 uh, and um, we can see for negative 3 pi over 2 this time we start here we go that's negative pi over 2 negative 2 pi over 2 negative 3 pi over 2 so that's the cosine is going to be uh, 0 because again that's the x value and continuing in this manner you fill out this table and you see that you get a similar graph to what we had for sine now if you look at the two of them next to each other you realize just how similar they are here in blue we have the cosine function and in red we have the sine function so you can see that if you were to physically pick up the cosine curve and move it over exactly pi over two units you end up placing it right on top of the sine curve and they would overlap so they're really just off by just pi over two units and that is called a phase shift so we'll get into that uh, soon but the key points for sine as far as our graphing it is concerned were right here at zero then pi over two then pi three pi over two and two pi we consider one standard cosine uh, cycle to start at the same point zero and get, go to pi over 2 and then pi 3 pi over 2 and 2 pi as well but notice with the sine function you start at right here what's called the baseline then you go to a max value then you go back to the baseline then the next uh, significant point is down here at the minimum value that it takes negative 1 then back to the baseline for cosine the significant y values associated to those x values are going to be the max value baseline min value baseline and then max value and that's uh, going to play an important role later on when we try to do more complex looking sinusoids and um, because of how similar they are notice that we call uh, any graph that has this particular shape uh, a sinusoid now of course given how closely related they are we could have called them cosinusoids too but you have to admit <laughs> sinusoid sounds a lot better so that's why sine won the uh, game when it comes to that naming uh, situation and of course the domain and range for the cosine function are exactly the same as they were for the sine function domain is all real numbers there's no x value that doesn't correspond to some cosine value and the range of course as you know the unit circle bounds all these values so you're not going to go there's not going to be any angle that's going to have a cosine greater than one or a cosine less than negative one all other angles will have some cosine which is the x value between negative one and one so when it comes to these sinusoids which are remember they're graphs that are related to the sine and cosine function functions um, there are a few um, key elements we need to understand in order to be able to successfully graph these the first of these that we will discuss is what we call the period which as we have already mentioned it's going to be the interval on the x-axis here where the sine will run through one full cycle of its values just like that so as you can see we're here we're using the sine function as an example but this holds for any sinusoid so if you take the starting point and the ending point and subtract them you're going to end up with the length of the period so in this case you can see the period is exactly 2 pi 
the standard cycle starts at zero, ends at two pi, and as it turns out, not all the sinusoids that we're going to encounter are going to be so nicely positioned as the sine curve. So there is a really nice, easy way to find the period of any sinusoid, even if it's completely located elsewhere and not simply situated the way the sine curve is, the standard sine curve. So what we can do is we can take any two consecutive <clears throat> max values, such as these two, we call those two peaks or two crests, or we can take any two min values, they're also known as, known as troughs. So if we take any two such consecutive values and subtract them, of course, larger minus the smaller. So here, pi over 2 minus negative 3 pi over 2, that will give us the period, which as we know is 2 pi. So it works out with this method as well. Or if we take two troughs like this, so it'll be 3 pi over 2 minus negative pi over 2, and we also get 2 pi. So that is the simplest way if we have the graph for us to obtain the period. And that's the method that we'll use uh, when we try to uh, graph these uh, sinusoids. The next uh, concept that we want to look at is the baseline or the next element of sinusoids we're going to uh, study. And if you look at this sine curve, you can see that it basically is split in half with this line that runs right through its center. So the baseline is basically going to be a line the length of which will be exactly halfway through the interval on the y-axis which corresponds to its range and the again there's a very easy way to obtain the y value as you know any horizontal line is going to have the form y equals some constant. So we need to know what that constant is. Of course, we can see for the sine curve that constant is very simple. It's the x-axis itself, so it's y equals zero. But not all sinusoids are going to be so simply situated or so nicely situated. So for general sinusoids, we're going to use this formula. So we're going to take the maximum y value and the minimum y value and we're going to basically find the midpoint of them which is also known as the average. So we basically take the maximum y value, add it to the uh, minimum y value and divide by 2. If that formula looks familiar to you, because it is, it's the basic formula for the midpoint of two um, numbers on a number line. So Notice that how nicely this formula works for this case of a simple sine curve because the maximum value is 1, the minimum value is negative 1, so when we add those, we get 0 divided by 2, which is 0. But this will work in more complex situations as well. The next uh, item on our agenda is going to be what we mean by the amplitude of a sinusoid. And that basically is going to be depicted right here. As you can see, it's how far above and how far below the baseline the sinusoid actually goes. Again, for the case of the sine function, it's very simple. We know it goes one up and one below the baseline. But Given that we're going to be dealing with more general sinusoids later, we need to have a way of finding it. And that way is going to be very simple. You can see from the graph, if you take the maximum y value that the sinusoid achieves and subtract from it the baseline y value, you'll get it. In this case, it'll just be 1 minus 0 will give it to us. Or you can take the baseline value 
and subtract uh, from it the minimum value that the sinusoid achieves and that will get the same thing done because here you get 0 minus negative 1 which is equal to 1 uh, and that's how we manage to find the amplitude so those are the basic elements that uh, we need to know about sinusoids and from this point forward we're going to be looking at more complex ones and in order to do that we need to really understand the notion of transformations of functions which you have probably seen in your algebra class and recall that sine and cosine after all are functions if you um, remember from your algebra class you can do a very quick test to see if a particular graph corresponds to a function or not and that was called the vertical line test which said if no vertical line crosses the graph of a particular relation more than once then that relation is a function and of course both the sine and cosine pass the vertical line test with flying colors so they are after all functions so anything that we discuss right now regarding uh, transformations of functions will apply to uh, sines and cosines as well now there are three main types of transformations of functions the first one we call translations these are just basic movements of uh, the function in either a horizontal direction or a vertical direction and um, notice that they move the graph either up down left or right but they don't change the basic shape of the graph they preserve the shape dilations are the next type of transformation we will look at a dilation is an actual stretching or shrinking about an axis as a result of a multiplication or division and that multiplication or division can either happen at the input level at the x level or at the output which is the y or the f of x level in the definition of the function uh, di dilations can definitely change the shape of uh, the graph of a function reflections are the simplest type of um, transformation of a graph of a function and that's when you just basically reflect either by, by multiplying the input by negative one or the output and all that's going to do is going to reflect either with respect to the baseline or the horizontal axis of the graph or uh, vertically uh, uh, with respect to the vertical axis associated with the graph uh, this four here is just a typo ignore it you know how you hit enter sometimes and microsoft automatically adds a number there are basically just three types of transformations make sure you look at this and absorb it hit pause at any point that you need to before you proceed now we want to delve a little bit more deeply into these different types of transformations of functions and the first type we'll look at are translations so for all of these transformations we're going to assume that we have the graph of a given function and in all of these that given function is going to be the f of x function which is going to be shown in red and then we want to apply some kind of a constant either at the output level f of x or at the input level x itself and see what kind of a change is brought on to the graph of the function so let me zoom in a bit now the the first two translations here are vertical translations this is when you add a constant k which is greater than zero to the f of x uh, level of uh, the function and what happens with these these are very simple transformations which we refer to as translations and you're just gonna take the graph and move it up by the amount of k 
in this case, k that I'm showing in this example is 2. So here's a graph of a function. Notice it passes the vertical line test, etc. And all this adding of k does is moves the entire function up two units. In case you're curious, that is the graph of x cubed, f of x equals x cubed. And we just add 2 to it, and it moves it up 2 units. If I subtract the same constant 2, it takes the original graph, and it moves it down 2 units. So the first kind of uh, translation where we moved it up is called an upward vertical shift. And the general category, as far as all transformations is concerned, is considered a translation. The next type, where we move the original function's graph down, is called a downward vertical shift. And again, the general category of transformation is translation. The next thing we can do is we can bring the change at the input level. So if, if instead of f of x, I look at f of x minus some constant, then what that's going to do is it's going to take the graph and move it to the right. Notice it may be a little counterintuitive because here when you saw the minus, you went down. So sometimes people make the mistake of thinking when they see a minus in this situation, that's going to move it to the left. It's exactly the opposite. And if you work with the definition of the functions uh, a little bit, you'll see exactly why that happens. One way of thinking about it is the fact that whatever happens to f of x basically is going to happen to f of x minus k, k units later. In this case, two units later. The next is f of x plus k. So for example, if this is in red f of x and you want to look at the graph of f of x plus 2, that's just going to take the graph and move it two units to the left. So make sure you understand the difference in the way vertical and horizontal translations work before you proceed. It's important to note that translations, while they may move the graph either vertically or horizontally, they do not change the shape of the graph. The same cannot be said about dilations. Dilations where you either multiply the output by k or the input by a constant k as opposed to if you recall with translations you're adding or subtracting from the output or the input here you're multiplying these do change the shape of the function uh, for example if you take a function f of x such as the one shown here that should look familiar to you that's the graph of x squared and if you multiply it by a constant greater than one, then what you're going to do is basically at each x value, you're going to double the y value. So for the same x value, you're doubling the y value. So notice that results in kind of a vertical stretch upward. And that's going to change the basic shape of the function. So, of course, if the value of k was larger, this would have even been more dramatic, the vertical stretch or dilation um, that occurred here. Now, if you were to multiply the original function in red by one half, you actually slow down the rate at which the y values change. So for each x value, the corresponding y value will be one half what it was for the original function in red. This results, as you can see, in another change in the shape of a function 
but in this case a widening. Here when the k was greater than 1 we noticed there was a narrowing. Here we, get, we notice we get a widening. Just like in the case of translations how these two behaved somewhat differently with the values of k involved the same thing happens here with horizontal dilations when the k is actually between 0 and 1 so some fraction some proper fraction like one half two thirds etc and you change the input from x to um, kx you actually end up widening the original graph and when the k is greater than 1 changing the input of f of uh, x to kx you actually end up narrowing it so the best way to remember this is that here when you're just multiplying at the f of x level you're doing a vertical stretch or a vertical um, compression pulling down here you're doing the exact opposite you're doing it in the x direction so here you're doing a stretch in the first case and you're doing a compression in the second case so these take a little bit of getting used to make sure you study these and come to terms with them and understand them for yourself before you proceed. The last type of transformation is the simplest one. They're called reflections and that's when you change f of x to negative f of x. And basically the original function here when we're multiplying at the functional level, at the f of x level, the output level, it just flips it with respect to the x-axis it's not always going to be with respect to the x-axis this is a simple example we're looking at it's just going to be basically whatever axes uh, the function is defined over and when you change the input to negative x here you bring in the change about at the input level you're going to be doing a horizontal flip so notice the original function f of x is getting reflected with respect to the y-axis in this case. Also notice that when you multiply the f of x of the, the original function at the output level by negative 1, the x values remain the same but the outputs all become reversed and negative. When you bring the change at the input level, notice the y values remain the same, but the, all the x values of this new function are going to get transferred to the other side. So it's either a vertical flip or a horizontal flip. And that brings us to the end of the various types of transformations. And I wanted to handle this at as general a level as possible so that it helps you in your future classes when you deal with functions other than sinusoids and of course everything we just discussed is going to immediately be applied to sinusoids at this time make sure you pause the video go back understand all the different kinds of transformations before you proceed so everything we just discussed about transformations applies to all functions but now we want to bring our focus back to trigonometric functions and transformations of the sine and cosine functions which generate in general sinusoids and they basically fall into two categories in fact given any sinusoid you can either write it as a sine function or as a cosine function in the most general form they can be written in this way or in this way and uh, we'll do an example at the very end of the lecture well we'll take the same graph whose equation we do not know and we'll write it as both a sine function and a cosine function because if you remember they're almost the same graph just off by a 
factor or a phase shift of pi over two. <clears throat> so um, it's important to understand what each of these letters mean, and we're going to practice them uh, plentifully so you'll fully understand them. But just as a preliminary uh, discussion, remember that in this case, that's basically going to be how much you're going to be shifting the sinusoid up or down uh, when it comes to the standard sine or cosine curve. So A here is just going to be what we discussed before as the baseline of your sinusoid. And uh, for a general sinusoid, you can find it by the formula we discussed earlier. You take the maximum y value and the minimum y value, add them and divide by two, and you get what A is, which is basically the, the vertical shift constant of the sinusoid. B here, in both cases, is going to be the amplitude of the sinusoid. And if you recall, we did it in two ways for the sine function. And you can take either the maximum y value and subtract from it the y value corresponding to the baseline, or you can take the y value of the baseline and subtract from it the y value of the minimum um, function value. And that's going to be the vertical dilation factor of the sinusoid. And when we say dilation here, it could be either a stretch or a compression. Dilation is a word that's used in general for both. And um, even though that could be confusing because when you think dilation, you always think of a stretch. In mathematics, we speak in very general terms. We just think of the other. When in the case of a um, compression as a negative dilation. So uh, next we get to C, which is going to be, if you recall from our general functional discussion, that's bringing a change about at the input level. So you know that's going to be attached to some high horizontal uh, dilation. And the way that we're going to find C for um, sinusoids is we're going to take 2 pi and divide it by the period. And you'll see why that's uh, true in a minute through some examples. Just for the time being, remember that that's how we're going to calculate this um, constant C. And uh, we already know how to find the period. And this is the period itself is just a horizontal interval required for the sinusoid to, to run through one full cycle of its values. Again, we discussed these individually earlier. And that is considered the horizontal dilation factor of the sinusoid. D, which is again bringing a change about in the at the input level, is going to be the phase shift of the sinusoid. In other words, if you take the absolute value of that uh, number D, that's going to be the shortest distance between the point the sinusoid begins to run through a standard cycle of its values, as we saw earlier, and where the related sine or cosine function begin its uh, full cycle. And that's the horizontal shift constant. So C was the horizontal dilation factor, but this is the horizontal shift constant, how much left or right the curve, the standard sine or cosine needs to move to get this more complex version. And um, while we're going to basically eventually be able to handle a sinusoid which has all these constants in it, we're actually going to start with simpler cases where we just take one constant at a time and deal with it. That'll make it much easier to uh, handle the more complex cases. So that's what we're heading for first. So make sure you absorb everything that's in here before we proceed. Okay, so first let's take a look at uh, a simple vertical translation of uh, the sine or cosine function. And those have the general form just a plus sine x or a plus cosine x. And uh, as a simple example, consider uh, the first function f1 of x being sine x, we want to show all these on the same graph 
all three of them because that's going to be the easiest way to see the relationships. Uh, for the second function, f2 of x will consider sine of x plus 3. And for the third function, that should be a 3, we consider sine x minus 3. So we have the correct 3 here. Uh, anyway, so as you re recall, this is just going to be bringing a change at the output or y level. So all the, in the case of f2 of x equals sine x plus 3, all the y values of the standard sine function shown here in red are going to get lifted by three units so it's just the upward vertical translation or upward shift of three units and in the case of sine x minus three or f3 of x we're just going to take the standard sine curve and pull it down three units now if i zoom into these tables uh, for a minute, you realize that basically here we're going to have um, the same x values. Notice the x values are the same for the three functions, but what is changing, the change is happening at the f of x level. So here in the case of f2 of x, which is sine x plus 3, all the y values are increasing by 3 from 0 to 3 1 to 4 negative 1 to 2 and 0 to 3 so that's exactly what's happening there and for this one notice same x values but the outputs the y values are decreasing by three units each and that's a simple vertical um, shift of a sinusoid And of course, exactly the same thing happens with the cosine curve. We didn't want to leave the cosine out. So um, this is the standard cosine function right here, f of x. And you can see here, we're just going to pull it up three units. And here, we're going to pull it down three, un three units. And the same situation with the tables happens with respect to this function as well. Now, the next simple type of translation we look at is just a horizontal uh, translation or shift, one for the sine function and one for the cosine function. And since they behave very similarly, we're not going to overdo the matter and we'll just do an example involving the sine function so here we have in red just the standard sine function depicted in uh, the case of f2 of x we see that in blue notice here the input is changing from x to x minus pi over 3 if you remember with horizontal shift a minus actually indicates a movement to the right. So the red curve, which is the standard sine curve, gets shifted three units, uh, pi over three, sorry, pi over three units to the right. And in the case of F3 of X, which is sine of X plus pi over three, remember a plus indicates a shift of the original function sine X to the left by the amount of the shift, which is pi over 3. And um, as you can see here, this time, what is not changing are the outputs, because the y values, notice, don't change. What's happening is a change in the input. And in the case of sine of x minus pi over 3, notice basically the inputs are changing remember that's a movement to the right so these are going up by pi over 3 in each case and in the case of sine of x plus pi over 3 a movement to the left these x values are going to go down by a pi over 3 each each now what's really important for us to understand is 
when we try to graph these kinds of translations, we usually are only interested in graphing just one full cycle uh, of the graph, because as you know, um, the rest is just going to repeat. So we need to come up with the tables shown if we're going to do these by hand on our own. So we get the values for the tables by following the following procedure. We, for the case of sine of x minus pi over 3, if you remember, that's a shift to the right. So we're going to take the five main points of sine x itself, which were, remember, the points of interest were 0, pi over 2, pi and then all the way up to 2 pi right in the case of the red graph okay so what we're going to do pi right here and then 3 pi over 2 and 2 pi so we're going to basically add a pi over 3 to each of those to find out the five points of interest and remember if you bring your attention to the red curve only the points of interest are right there, right here, right there, right there, and finally right there. So there's one, two, three, four, five points of interest, which break the one cycle into four equal parts. One from here to here, zero to pi over two, one from pi over two to pi, another equal segment from pi to 3 pi over 2, and finally one from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi. So we're also interested in those five significant points for the shifted uh, blue function. And for to get those, we're just going to take the five significant points of the standard sine curve, which were 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi and we're going to add pi over 3 to each of them to find out what those five significant points for the blue curve are one standard cycle of the blue curve <clears throat> so we end up with pi over 3 here we're adding those two so we need a common denominator and we end up with 5 pi over 6 here Think of this as pi over 1. Again, we need a common denominator, so we end up with 4 pi over 3. <clears throat> For the next one, 11 pi over 6, and finally 7 pi over 3. So these are going to be the five main points of interest when it comes to the blue graph, <clears throat> which is sine of x minus pi over 3. And um, <clears throat> of course, we keep in mind that this is just, since this is just a simple horizontal shift, the y values are not going to change in either case, but especially this one, which we're focusing on right now. And um, that's basically how we can do a simple horizontal shift like that. All right, next we'll look at... Uh, vertical dilations vertical dilations deal with either stretching the original uh, red curve which is the standard sine curve or compressing it in the vertical direction so in the case of um, f1 of x equals sine x f2 of x equals 2 sine x and f3 of x equals 1 half sine x for example if we focus on f2 of x, which is given in blue here, notice you're just doubling the height of the original sine function at each point. Now, of course, in the negative region, when you double, you become even more negative. In fact, twice as negative. So that's a very simple situation depicted in these tables, uh, these three tables right here. So uh, notice that um, in this case, the x values remain the same 
and in the case of 2 sine x, each of these y values are going to get doubled. Of course, double 0 is just 0, but double 1, you get 2. 0 again, negative 1 times 2 will give you the negative 2, and 0 times 2 again, 0. And uh, for the case of 1 half sine x, you just do the same thing, except notice from the first to the third table, the x values remain the same, the y values are going to get halved. So that's where these numbers come from. So that's also a very simple uh, kind of transformation, a vertical dilation. Horizontal dilations usually end up in more dramatic changes. And uh, here we're looking at f1 of x equals sine x in the red, as usual. We're looking at f2 of x being sine of 2x. So again, the change is happening at the input level. And f3 of x equals sine of 1 half x. So keeping our attention on the blue curve, notice that if you recall, when the dilation factor is greater than 1, that's going to result in a actual compression and that's why you see compared to the red curve the blue curve completes its cycle well because the factor is 2 in half the period needed for the red curve to complete a full cycle so Whereas the period for the original sine function goes from 0 to 2 pi, the period of the blue curve is only going from, let me make that slightly larger. As you can see, it just needs from 0 to pi to complete one full cycle. With respect to f3 of x, which is if you recall sine of one half x, the opposite is going to happen. Remember when the compression factor is between, uh, or the dilation factor is between zero and one, that actually results in a stretch when it de when we're dealing with horizontal dilations. So in this case, uh, rather than the green curve completing one of its cycles in 2 pi, it's going to actually take twice that uh, length of the, uh, an interval to complete one full cycle. And the interesting thing to notice is that if you take, um, For example, f2 of x, which is sine of 2x, notice that the period which we discussed as pi in the case of the blue curve, you can get by dividing 2 pi, but by the period of uh, sine of 2x, and you end up with 2 pi over 2, which is 2, and that's exactly what that factor 2 is. So if we know the graph, and we know the period, we can come up with the constant here. Later on, when we go backward and we don't have the equation, but rather we have a graph from which we're supposed to determine the equation, it's going to be important for us to come up with that constant c. And that's exactly how we do it. We take 2 pi and divide it by the period of the uh, function, and that'll tell us what that constant is going to be that dilation constant now if you look over here at the right at the tables you'll notice that here the y values are the ones that are staying the same because remember we're only doing a horizontal dilation we're stretching or compressing only horizontally so the y values remain the same it's the x values that change and um, that is basically how we handle um, horizontal dilations or compressions. Okay, I had to pause there for a second because my 
PDF program was having a little bit of difficulty handling all the zooming in and zooming out. So uh, do notice that in the case of sine 2x, which is uh, f2 of x, the y values remain the same, but the x values actually become halved because remember, this is going to happen in half the length of the period of regular sine x. And in this case, the x values get doubled and it's a great idea to actually calculate these for yourself and convince yourself that these work which is a simple thing to do given the unit circle that you're familiar with now last we cover the simplest type which is reflections and so here we're looking at f1 of x being sine x and f2 of x being negative sine x. And that, of course, is going to be just a simple vertical reflection. And notice we did it here for the sine function and here we do it for the cosine function. So these two are, of course, the simplest types of uh, reflections. Here we show the x values for sine and negative sine x in the same table, notice all you're doing is each of the outputs are gonna get multiplied by negative one. And the x values remain the same as those for the original sine function. Same here, except here we're dealing with the cosine function. Okay, now that we've seen all the basic simple moves and transformations we're ready to tackle these more complex varieties where all the constants here are in play and here i'm just repeating what we discussed a little while ago make sure you pause the video take a look at this make sure you remember what everything meant before we go on and do the more complex problems so in this next example, we're going to look at this function, f of x, which is a sinusoid of the sine variety. And its definition is 3 plus 2 sine of 2 times x minus pi over 2. So we're going to break it down. Remember what each of these things mean. Remember that the a is uh, the baseline. So that means instead of the x-axis being the center line or the baseline for this function it's going to be y equals three so it's shifted up and um, the baseline will be y equals three b if you remember is going to be the amplitude that that tells you how far above or below the baseline uh, a graph goes so this one is going to be twice as uh, tall actually of the graph of the standard sine function and um, also given the amplitude and the baseline we can now calculate the max and min values of this function if you remember we can get uh, b by using the formula y max minus y base and using that simple equation plugging in for b we get 2 y max is what we're trying to find out and we know that the baseline is going to be 3 so if you just solve this simple equation by moving negative 3 to the other side you end up with my y max equals 5. we also know that we can write b as y of the baseline the y value of the baseline minus the y value of the minimum point of the sinusoid so we get 2 equals 3 minus y min solve this simple equation for y min and you end up with y min equals 1. we move this to the other side becomes positive move 2 to the other side becomes negative so we get 3 minus 2 which is 1. now we move on to c which in this case if you notice it's right there c is 2. So we have C, but we don't have the period, but we know the relationship between C and the period. Remember, C is 2 pi over the period. 
So we end up with 2 equals 2 pi over p. This implies that if I just write the 2 as 2 over 1 equals 2 over p, then I can cross multiply. So I get 2p equals 2 pi times 1, which is 2 pi. Solving this for p gives me p equals pi. So we know that the period of this sinusoid is pi. Next, we move on to d, which is pi over 2. So this is going to be the phase shift of the sinusoid. That means how much we have to move it. And in this case, that's going to end up in a positive k. So we're going to move it to the right. Now, one of the most important things that we need to do, if you recall, to graph any sinusoid, we need to know the five significant points that are required to graph the sinusoid. We know that this sinusoid uh, has been shifted pi over two units to the right. So the very first point is going to be pi over two itself. And we know that the period of this uh, sinusoid is pi. So if we take the starting point of pi over two and add pi to it, just like that, we end up with pi over 2 plus 2 pi over 2, that plus shouldn't be there, we end up with 3 pi over 2. So we know that it starts at pi over 2 and ends at 3 pi over 2. So we have the starting point and we have the ending point. We still need to find these other three points. But that's going to be easy because what we know is that these sinusoids get split up into four equal parts. One is this interval right here, the next is from here to here, and then from there to there, and finally from here to the end point. So if we take the first point and add one fourth of the period, to it, we should get what this second point is. And then again, add a quarter point to the uh, pi over, uh, a quarter of a pi to that, which is a quarter of the period. We'll get the next one on and on. So starting with pi over two, which is our first point, we're gonna add pi over four, which is one fourth of the period to get our next point, which is three pi over four right here. And then We'll take the 3 pi over 4 and add, add another pi over 4 to it. That'll give us the next point. And then take pi and add another pi over 4 to it. That's where we get the 5 pi over 4. And the last one we need is take to take the 5 pi over 4 and add another pi over 4, which gives us 6 pi over 4, which is the same as 3 pi over 2. So that's how we end up getting the five significant points for this particular sinusoid. And of course, we know that um, the y values here are going to be easy. Remember, we have the center, we have the, the standard sine graph, right? Starts at the center line, then goes max, center line, low, up. So the center line here being what? Being three. So that's where we get the three. And then we know that the amplitude here is two. So we know that that high point is going to be five. We go back to the center line here. So that's where we get the three again. And then we go to the min value, which we know is two below the center line. So that's where we get the one and then back up to the center line. So which is at three. This is how we get our information that we need to graph such a sinusoid and that's as pretty much as complex as these are going to get so if you understand this you're in great shape so notice that we can discuss this from a general functional transformation point of view now and what has happened here is that the original sine curve shown here in red has been sh basically shifted to the right pi over two units it has been shifted upward 
three units or raised upward three units it has been vertically stretched by a factor of uh, two because of this two here and it has been horizontally compressed by a factor of two because of this two here and all of this makes sense from the general discussion of transformations of functions which we spoke about earlier so it's always good to have those in mind as we proceed with this material so make sure that you back this video up understand this fully before you move on to the next example all right into this next next example i wanted to throw in a few twists and turns in the road which you might encounter so that <clears throat> you make sure you know how to handle them and um, <clears throat> notice first of all in this case if we want to be in this general form as a cosine function one thing we need to do first of all is bring that c out right the constant so we notice here that the x is multiplied by pi. So the first thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and factor that pi out of that expression, that argument or input. And when we do that, notice when you take out a pi, that leaves you x plus, and take out a pi from there, that leaves you 2 thirds. So this becomes the general form of this sinusoid, which is in agreement with our original general form now we can go ahead and determine what a b c and d are for this <clears throat> sinusoid so that we can go ahead and graph it so firstly we notice that a is negative 2 by now we know that that's the baseline and by the way I do think you should be able to finish this now that you've seen the most important trick. So um, you should try to do this on your own for maximum benefit before you proceed with the video. But um, when you do so, definitely come back. All right. So I'm hoping you tried it on your own before you came back. So notice that we have uh, the y min is just going to be negative 2 minus 1 half you may wonder why minus 1 half because remember the amplitude is the absolute value of this number so it's actually a half so this graph goes one half units above and one half units uh, unit one half of a unit below the baseline so uh, the low point is going to be negative 2 minus 1 half, which is negative 5 halves, which is negative 2.5. And the max value, you're just going to go a half units above the negative 2. So that's where we get the negative 3 halves or negative 1.5. B here is, uh, of course, the amplitude. And the amplitude is always considered to be a positive number. So whereas B here is going to be uh, indicating the fact that it's negative is going to indicate that we're going to have a vertical flip so just so we're uh, clear on that um, so the next thing that we need to find is c and c is pi right there and we know that's 2 pi over the period so if we again write it as pi over 1 equals 2 pi over p we can cross multiply and we end up with 2p equals pi p therefore p equals 2. so this is a little bit different because we're used to periods being multiples of pi here we have an integer for the period and that cat can be 2 and this is exactly how it happens when you get a pi as the coefficient that is being multiplied by the argument and uh, in this case notice that d is negative two-thirds because when you write c my x minus d 
and if you write x plus two thirds as x minus something that something is going to be negative two thirds so d here is negative two thirds the phase shift is negative two thirds so the five significant x values that will help us generate one full cycle are going to be negative two thirds and we need to find one so in other words it starts at negative two-thirds which here is shown right there and to get the other significant points we're going to have to take the period which we know is two uh, we discussed earlier and we're going to uh, take the two and find out what one-fourth of it is and of course one-fourth times two is one-half so we need to start with negative two-thirds then keep adding a half until we get our five significant points. So our five significant points are negative two thirds, negative one sixth, one third, five sixths, and four thirds. Now, um, as far as making our table is concerned, we know what the X values are gonna be. They're just gonna be these. For the Y values, remember that we discussed earlier that the minimum Y value is gonna be negative five halves and the maximum is going to be negative three halves so and we know that this is a flipped cosine curve so it's going to start at the minimum value then it's going to go to its center line then it's going to go to its max value back to the center line and then to the minimum value so the y values associated with these points are going to be the min value which is negative 2.5 then the center line, which is negative two, then the max value, which is gonna be negative one and a half or negative three halves, then back to the center line, that's where we get the negative two, and then finally a low point right there, min value, which is negative 2.5. So that's how you handle a situation like this, which is a little bit different from the standard cases we've seen. And, uh, Let's do our final uh, general discussion of um, functional transformations. Notice that in this case, the standard cosine curve, which you see here in red, that's the standard cosine curve. Notice what has happened is it has been shifted to the left two thirds uh, units because of that positive two thirds. Remember when you're doing a horizontal shift, a positive here actually indicates a shift to the left it has been lowered two units because of the negative two it has been vertically shrunk by a factor of one half because of that one half right there it has been um, horizontally compressed by a factor of pi right there and it has also been vertically flipped because of that negative right there so we basically get a little bit of everything in this problem so make sure that you back things up and totally understand what happened here before you proceed because if you can um, understand this one you have a solid grasp of what's going on in this section Finally, and yes, believe it or not, finally, we've reached the last example. Sometimes we're given the graph of a sinusoid, like depicted here, and we're not given the equation, and we're asked to actually find the equation. And as I mentioned to you earlier, if you have any sinusoid like this, you can write it as either a sine curve or a cosine curve. So also notice that as far as the baseline, as far as the amplitude is concerned, or the fact that um, C gives uh, basically two pi over the period, even as far as finding C is concerned. So as far as A, B, and C are concerned, the calculations are gonna be identical. So 
when we want to write this as both a sine type sinusoid and a cosine type sinusoid, we only calculate the A, B, and C once. The only difference between the two are going to be at the D level, which is the phase shift. So when you want to write it as a sine uh, type sinusoid, which is the first part of this example, we're going to try to see the closest place where this function looks like the standard sine function. Remember, the standard sine function starts at the zero line, right? At the center line here, and it goes to it goes baseline, max, baseline, min, baseline. If you look at this graph, the closest place that happens is right there. So sometimes the easiest thing to figure out first is actually the phase shift, which is going to be D, which is pi over 2. Now, as far as the baseline, that's also easy to see. You can see that the baseline here is going through Y equals 4. So we have A equals 4. That's our uh, baseline value. You can see that the max value that it reaches is 6. So therefore, that's going to tell us that the amplitude is 2. So that's easy to find. And uh, C is going to be 2 pi over the period. And we can see here the beginning point of this cycle of this sinusoid is at pi over 2. The ending point is at 3 pi over 2. So if we subtract in this manner, 3 pi over 2 minus pi over 2, we end up with 2 pi over 2, which is pi. So the period of this sinusoid is pi. So to get C is now easy, because remember, C is 2 pi over the period. So we get 2 pi over pi. So that tells us C is 2. And we already discussed that the phase shift if you're looking at this as a sine like type sinusoid is going to be pi over 2 we have everything we need to write the equation now so we get f of x equals a which is 4 plus b which is 2 sine of c which we discussed here was 2 times x minus the phase shift which was pi over 2 and there you have it. That's the equation of this graph as a sine type uh, sinusoid. The beauty of it is you can take the same uh, graph and you can describe it as a cosine function. And notice the A, B, and C will all be the same. The only difference is if you're looking at this as a cosine function, remember how the cosine function behaves? Uh, let's pause and go take a look at it. If you remember, the cosine function has a standard cycle that starts at a max value, goes down to the baseline, then to the min, then to back to the baseline, and then up to the max. So we want to look for this shape in our problem. And if we look at this graph, the closest positive value where that can happen and Again, you can use a negative value too, but normally it's easier for us just to go for the closest positive value where that happens. Uh, but if somebody insisted, you could use that point as well, but it'll just be a negative phase shift. But the first positive value where this looks like the cosine curve, remember, max, baseline, min, baseline, max, is right here at 3 pi over 4. So and that's going to be the only difference in the two equations. The phase shift, as far as a cosine curve is concerned, is going to be 3 pi over 4. So we're ready to write it. It's going to be 4 plus 2 cosine of 2. Everything looks the same except sine becomes cosine, and that changes to minus 3 pi over 4. And that's how we get the expression for basically the same graph but written in terms of a cosine function.
we can of course test the claim that these two functions have the same graph by using a tool like Desmos to graph both uh, functions uh, and verify that fact. So just give me one second to set up my screens. Okay, so we can type our first function which is a sine type sinusoid y equals 4 plus 2 sine of 2 times x minus pi over 2 and we get the graph in green now we'll go ahead and type in our second expression which is 4 plus 2 cosine let me go ahead and put y equals it's kind of optional but i prefer it 2 cosine of 2 times x minus 3 pi and here comes the moment of truth as soon as i type in that 4 i should get a graph that overlaps with the first one and that's exactly what happened so if you um, watch the screen I'm gonna remove the second graph see we have the green graph and as soon as I go ahead and bring in the purple graph of course they coincide not surprisingly so that basically is uh, the way you handle uh, graphs of sinusoids and uh, we basically covered what usually gets covered in most textbooks in two sections in one section because i think the two sections are so tied in together it's much more coherent and mathematically sound to cover them in um, one section so uh, there you go and uh, Make sure you practice these and be safe until the next time that we meet.